Hello, my name is Pierre Riome, and I'm a researcher on the history of maple. The First Nations people knew all about maple water because they had a holistic approach to nature, which meant they used everything around them in their everyday lives, including trees, plants, flowers, and anything that they found useful. We know of two ways the First Nations people used maple water from writings. The first was as a tonic, and the second was as an eye wash used in their houses. These houses got very smoky in the winter, despite their efforts to vent the smoke, so they used maple water to wash and lubricate their eyes. First Nations people had specific cooking techniques. They used two different types of pots before being introduced to iron cauldrons, made from birch bark and terracotta. The cooking technique used for both types of pots involved putting hot stones into maple water, or water in general, to bring it to a boil. However, there's no evidence that the First Nations people produced anything other than a more concentrated maple water, which the first explorers like Lafito, d'Iberville and Sagal tried and said was better when water was added because they were comparing it to lemonade. Ever since the first European settlers arrived, the economy here was primarily based on the fur trade. To boost trade, the French would send envoys. These envoys were people that were chosen to live with the native communities so they could learn the language and customs. So you can see how it was inevitable that knowledge was shared when you had someone living with a First Nations community for a winter or a year and vice versa. When the first explorers arrived, the First Nations people were very taken with the iron cauldrons and tools they encountered. They were intelligent people, excellent farmers, and astute traders. They could see right away that such tools could improve their way of life, and that's exactly what they did. Obviously, if you have an iron cauldron and you've never used one before, or a copper one because they had copper too, then you would need to learn how to use one from someone else. We can be fairly certain that it was this kind of motivation that led people to share their knowledge, especially with regard to maple water and turning it into maple sugar. It should be pointed out that they were not able to produce maple syrup for quite a while for the simple reason that they hadn't yet figured out how to conserve it or produce it. Maple sugar has always been described as a red sugar. The French were always a little disheartened when they found they couldn't whiten it, because at that time, white was synonymous with purity. They used to think that if you could turn this sugar into a white sugar, then it would taste better. So red sugar was being used. Note that before the British conquest, the French still living in France were somewhat envious of the eating and cooking habits of the settlers here. They ate well here. After the British conquest, it was a different story. The people had been conquered and cut off from their cultural roots. They weren't a priority for the British Empire. This obviously had consequences. Certain products like white sugar, which was used in cooking, became scarce. As white sugar became harder to obtain, good old maple sugar became what we call sucre du pays, or country sugar, as it became the only sugar available. So unlike in the days before British control, maple sugar started to be used more and more in cooking. In the 1930s, barrels completely changed the way maple products were marketed. Barrels allowed for better storage and transportation, 
which increased its availability. Cans made it possible to distribute maple syrup in smaller quantities rather than just by the gallon, because from 1920 to 1950, maple syrup was sold by the gallon. Cans could hold smaller quantities of the product and it could therefore be spread over more points of sale, which greatly increased its availability to consumers. This was a big change. After the 1930s, we see a reverse in what was being produced. I would say that in the 1920s, the ratio was 10 to 1 in favor of maple sugar. In the 50s and 60s, this ratio had reversed. After 1970, the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food for Quebec had stopped recording maple sugar production because it had become such a fringe product. But they first had to perfect preservation of maple syrup. And there was a leading chemist who was part of a group of analyzing production to see how they could improve boiling techniques to preserve it. Maple syrup wasn't available in the 19th century. They could make it in sugar shacks and eat it there, but they couldn't preserve it. Before the British conquest, they used to put maple water in wooden casks and leave it out in the sun to thicken and age until it turned into vinegar, because they couldn't get vinegar from France. So the maple syrup we all know today was only available from the 1920s and 30s onwards because it was only then that it could be preserved in metal containers, both cans and barrels. From the very first mention of maple water in written records, we see it was viewed as a tonic, as it was with the First Nations people. It was believed to provide energy. Afterwards, when scientists were sent over by France to survey the region, they immediately deduced that it was a healthy product because it came from a tree and because of its flavor and qualities. They said it was good for the lungs. They always described it as a tonic and used it for what they called lung pains. So history shows it was already known for these qualities. Scientists like Duhamel de Monceau from the French Academy of Sciences and the 18th century botanist Peter Kalm all bore witness to the natural healthy qualities of maple syrup, which is essentially what recent research by the Federation of Quebec Maple Syrup Producers is concluding. They are proving what scientists in the 17th century already understood about the product. And as I already mentioned, the First Nations people believed it to be a healthy product as well. So maple really is a wonderful and healthy food from our own land. Alors c'est effectivement un beau produit santé qui vient de chez nous.